Good morning, friends, and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on public speaking. You remember well that in the previous lecture, we talked about digressions, and I had ended on a note saying, I digress to come again to the main topic. And once again, we are coming to the main topic, and the topic today, of course, the main topic is public speaking, but here today we are going to talk about forms and stages of public speaking. Now you might be thinking, what are these forms and what are the various stages and why they are essential? Right from the beginning, we have been talking about public speaking being actually uh, from the olden times in practice. So, if we can make a historical analysis or take a historical background of public speaking, you will find that earlier we had a sort of oral tradition even in uh, scriptures, in many of our religious books, even in many of our other books also you will come across uh, the uses of speeches to make people entertain and educate. In India especially, we had the ashrams where students would leave as disciples and the teacher being the guru will give them a discourse and the discourse students will carry back and they will employ in their own lives as a sort of something that they should be proud of. Now, since public speaking also has a sort of oral tradition and we try to understand here that oral tradition has been the most archaic mode of human communication. History is a witness to the fact that earlier we did not have much of the written material uh, before uh, the printing press uh, came out or was uh, invented. So, all forms of education were also uh, through a method where oral tradition was practiced. So, this oral tradition is quite dynamic in nature. It was actually a sort of diverse oral, oral medium, I mean speaking and listening. We have a long tradition even you know in many of the ashrams, you still find uh, that this tradition uh, follows. Of course, now in an age of science, uh, we come across such things very rarely, but still uh, if you uh, can come to certain ashrams where still this tradition follows, uh, they actually keep on, I mean students keep on reciting. Sometimes, you know, uh, they actually keep responding to what the teacher uh, speaks or teacher uh, says. So, it is one of the earliest modes of public speaking. Now, we have come a long way and we have different modes now. We have different sorts of medium now. But then, in order to understand the nitty gritty of public speaking, it is better that we actually go a little bit into our past. When we did not have the proper uh, theatres, uh, cinema halls and other things as modes of entertainment. But even then, because we did not have this uh, system of recording where people can get recorded version of things and all. So, everything used to be very live. So, even for entertainment or persuasion, public speaking has been quite locomotive in bringing change since its inception. In earlier days, when we did not have the facilities and people of course had to learn a lot. So, where could they learn and where could they watch such activities of public performances? I mean, they had amphitheaters, fine here you can find on the left hand side that here is an amphitheater. In most of the kingdoms in olden days, we had these amphitheaters and uh, the king or the head of that kingdom would come and sometimes they would deliver justice, sometimes they would 
talk about something and the people will listen instantly and much in awe, much in concentration. So, in ancient times, there were amphitheaters where people would gather for performances, fine, speeches, information, even you know, we are cognizant of the fact uh, that our Indian system, apart from uh, what has been described in our scriptures, we still have in our villages, you know, a form of local panchayat, where such things are delivered, even where uh, the scientific uh, wings have not reached. People used to practice these public speaking through different modes, sometimes through drama as well, sometimes through speeches as well. Even uh, in many uh, uh, um, corners of India, you can still find that sense, continue this tradition of public speaking when they deliver some lectures and they are for our advantage. Now, when we come to know about the genesis of public speaking, it actually started first in Greece and uh, the known facts depict that Greek society greatly relied on oral expressions. So, whatever could be spoken and whatever could be heard. Now, these people, especially the Greek people, they also made use of epideictic speeches. What are these epideictic speeches? They are actually meant to praise or blame someone. I mean, uh, people had to be made aware. If somebody had to be uh, praised or somebody had to be offered praises, so for that also public, spe public speaking uh, was a mode uh, and uh, this was actually uh, done by Greek people. They practiced rhetoric. That is why Romans were considered to be better actors. Uh, than uh, others, fine. So, they constantly evolved with governing structures with the use of public speaking. Here you can find on the right hand side how uh, somebody is uh, delivering and people there are listening to them. Of course, it is not that much uh, structured, but then uh, there is. We can also come across such descriptions in Shakespeare's plays uh, and in many other plays, we will come to that. So, when we talk about the genesis of public speaking in Rome, oratory was considered to be one of the major and elementary skill and every boy was taught to uh, speak, uh, speak in public. So, this oratory was an important skill and you can here find that how uh, if, if we compare it with the modern day, the way we have made uh, today our classrooms in many institutions and all, uh, we can find that there is uh, of course a reminder of what used to be practiced in Rome and the structure used to be like that. Even when uh, such a sort of structure was not there, it was actually practiced in the open fields. Uh, still you can find uh, that one form of it is practiced uh, as a street plays. Even, even in many parts of our country as well, uh, we can find uh, the depiction of a street plays, the enactment of a street plays. That is also one way of making people realize uh, the worth of speaking. So, Roman citizens were mostly expected to speak in public in their lifespan. Either they opined, I mean they gave their opinion or they took part in meetings, but almost everybody spoke in public gathering. So, this was actually a sort of skill which uh, uh, a Roman students or a Roman boy uh, had to uh, practice right from the beginning. Even in India, if we come, we find that we have a vast tradition of Sruti Parampara or the Sruti uh, tradition, fine. Now, what is this Sruti tradition? Uh, you might have come across these two terms, Sruti and Smriti. Sruti and Smriti. Sruti actually means something that can be heard or we have uh, uh, many you know works which are based on uh, um, what has been heard through generations and you know one form of it was a storytelling. You might all realize uh, that uh, uh, even, even today uh, this storytelling which we started in our grandmother's lap 
during the bed uh, bedtime uh, that that continues of course uh, the form has been developed but it is also a, a form of public speaking so oral tradition has also existed in indian subcontinent since time Im immemorial and this parampara or this tradition i mean learning through hearing learning through hearing flourished in cultural spiritual and social life many of you uh, might remember well that the four Vedas, they are uh, reminiscent of this fact and the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, fine, they are part of uh, this Indian tradition. The ancient classic, most of you uh, might be acquainted with Thiruvallur's Kural, Thiruvallur's Kural which is actually a Tamil classic text, uh, it has actually been translated in English as well. Uh, we will come to that also, uh, one uh, pope uh, and uh, two other writers they translated it. It is actually full of uh, the relations and there a lot of emphasis has been given on uh, uh, the power of speech. So, it actually contains two chapters on the virtues of our good speech. Now, my dear friends, uh, if we come to know about this Indic uh, knowledge tradition as we have been saying that in India also much before the world thought of many of you might be aware of or might have heard the name of Susrut, Susrut Samhita where you know uh, much before all these surgery and all these uh, uh, medical facilities took place. So, Susrut Samhita makes a mention of it then the Pythagorean uh, theorem we all uh, know uh, that we have some way or the other some of its uh, remaining origin in India and then the algorithm which was actually uh, developed by Al Khwajim and who does not know uh, the name of Panini's Astadhi which is uh, the modern day uh, in, in modern day times we can say the grammar that you are using it has its base in Panini's uh, Astadhi. So, the Vedas and the Upanishad, they are actually are the burning examples of uh, Indic knowledge tradition. These Vedic mantras, these Vedas uh, comes from uh, the word vid, that means to know. So, these four Vedas, uh, they, uh, they are actually Nitya, Nitya, that is eternal, something that cannot be changed and O Porusei meaning thereby that it was actually not created by humans rather it was created by some divine forces. So, now do you not believe that we had this oral tradition and we had it even in our ancient scriptures and we must be proud of it. My dear friends as we are mentioning Kural, so this Kural actually uh, a part of this classic Tamil literature uh, which is actually famous for the power of speech and the writer of this is Vallur, Vallur, Thiru Vallur, fine, Thiru Vallur. Now, we can take some of the lines where also a lot of importance has been given on the power of speech and when this was translated into English, let us take some lines where it is said, a tongue that rightly speaks the right is greatest gain, a tongue that rightly speaks. Now, the power of speech, it stands alone midst goodly things that men obtain. Now, you can find that there is a very beautiful uh, rhyming here also and uh, uh, the, the meaning is that the possession of goodness which is actually called the goodness of speech or the power of speech is better than any other goodnesses. All the worldly things, all the worldly possessions, they actually do not stand before the power of a beautiful speech, before the power of a golden tongue. A uh, golden tongue, why? Because it is powerful. Then again, we can take uh, another one. Since gain in loss in life on speech depend, let us look at the lines. Since gain and loss in life on speech depend from careless slip in speech, thyself defend. Now, very beautifully, uh, it has been analyzed that both gain and loss, they actually depend on speech. So, such is the power of speech. Both loss and gain, wealth 
and even evil result from speech. So, from careless slip, if there is a careless slip in speech, thyself defend. So, ministers should carefully guard themselves against fault or faulty speech. Is not it beautiful? So, you will find that the public speaking that we boast of today has its past even in ancient and old scriptures. Now, two more uh, you know uh, couplets. It is a speech that spellbound holds the listening ear. So, here it is a speech that spellbound holds the listening ear while those who have not heard desire to hear. So, such is the power of speech that which seeks elements as bind his friends. I mean it creates a sort of union and it is so delivered as to make even his enemies desire. I mean speech has got such an advantage and that advantage which actually even enemies also desire. Speak words adapted well to various hearers state. We are talking about the forms and stages of public speaking. Speak words adapted well to various hearers state, no high virtue leaves, no gain more surely great. So, one has to speak words which are actually well adapted to various hearers meaning thereby various audience, no higher virtue leaves, no gain more surely great. Understand the qualities of your hearers, understand your audience and make your speech for superior to it there is neither virtue nor wealth nor neither virtue nor wealth is superior to speech. Meaning thereby speech has actually got more power than anything else on earth. So, such beautiful lines have been uh, uttered or have been written uh, in Thiruvallur's uh, work that is Kural, Kural fine. Now, I came across one very beautiful book uh, in which Priyadarshi Datta uh, mentions in his uh, very significant book entitled The Microphone Men, How Orators Created a Modern India, fine. And there he says that in ancient Greece, speech was commonly abusive, rude, loud and scornful, whereas for Indians what he says, speech should be devoid of falsehood, devoid of rudeness and devoid of dissension. So, such is the power of speech, such actually should be the form of speech. Now, when we talk about uh, this public speaking, we find that this public speaking has found its room even in political circles and somebody who actually wants to become a very efficient, effective leader has also to practice his skills in public speaking. Uh, we can here take uh, one line by Israeli politician Yitzhak Samir who says, the will of people is resolved by a strong leadership. Even in a democratic society, events depend on a strong leadership with a strong power of persuasion. You might have found uh, that beautiful speeches have got actually the power of advocacy the power of persuasion and not on the opinion of the masses. That is why leaders always have an edge over the common public. Today, all of you uh, might always be eager to listen to good many political speeches. Of course, here uh, I am not talking about those speeches uh, which have uh, you know which can be termed as hate speeches, but those speeches which actually talk about uh, the welfare of the society. Even you know in uh, modern India, we can listen to the speeches uh, of even our present Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose speeches are very persuasive and one finds glued to, uh, one finds himself stuck to when uh, our leader speaks. So, public speaking has been the driving force for many rulers politicians, monarchs like Solon, Hitler, Mussolini, in India we can find Indira Gandhi, uh, Bajpai, 
fine. Uh, uh, even in uh, US, uh, Obama, earlier, uh, early, uh, earlier we had uh, Clinton, uh, even President Day, Hillary Clinton also is a very good speaker. And then in India, of course, uh, Modi here, fine. So there are several popular political speeches that are still heard and often quoted. When we shall uh, have a discussion on uh, speeches of the famous people and speeches for all occasions, we will also see to it how we can uh, find out the traits of an effective speech. But here, uh, even in literature, you can also find that there are plenty of examples in many uh, literary books where you will find uh, that speeches have always been able to persuade a sort of advocacy and have helped people do the desired thing. We can take a very classic example of one of Shakespeare's plays entitled Julius Caesar. All of you know the story uh, that Julius Caesar was killed by none other than his most faithful friend uh, Brutus. Now, initially Brutus did not want to kill Caesar because they were friends. And Brutus was a noble, Brutus was a republic and uh, he knew uh, that Rome could not survive well under the rule of Caesar. And you know, conspirators actually tried to have a sort of advantage over or tried to defeat uh, Caesar. So what they did? they decided that they should some way or the other conspire and fill the mind of Brutus with such thoughts that Brutus becomes ready uh, for uh, this conspiracy and they hatched a conspiracy. In this regard, we had Cassius who was very intelligent and he was the person who incited Brutus that Caesar must be killed. Earlier Brutus did not want to kill Caesar. Now here you can find a glance of or a glimpse of the political tinge or the political advocacy that Cassius makes. Let us have a look at what he says, I mean what Cassius says in his speech. Why man he doth bestride the narrow world? Why man he doth bestride the narrow world? Like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find our, ourselves dishonorable graves. Men that sometimes are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings, Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together, yours is as fair a name. Sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, it is as heavy, conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the name of all the gods at once, upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed? that he is grown so great, age thou art seemed, Rome thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. Now you can find here how it can even stir the minds of people who are quiet and the purpose was just to incite Brutus so that Brutus may actually be convinced that Caesar has to be killed. And after all these persuasions and all these persuasive advocacy, there came a time when Brutus said, yes, it must be by his death. And you know, later what happened? Caesar was killed. Caesar could not believe in Caesar said, it is too brute. So the question is that in political circles also, speeches have been very powerful. Speeches have always uh, have got a sort of power. Now, these forms of speeches, whether in politics, in culture, in society, in science, we have had so many people who have made their marks. And why they have made their marks? Some of the popular political speeches we can uh, take here. Say, for example, one speech by our first Prime Minister Pandit Nehru, when in his tryst 
uh, with destiny what he says. Long years we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. Not wholly or in full measure but very substantially. I mean we are now in a different world but we still go back and listen to such a speech. And not only in India but we can also uh, be reminiscent of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I have a dream where in the midst of his talk he says I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and leave out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. My dear friends, what Martin Luther King talked of equality through his political speech was also a sort of advocacy and in today's times who does not remember well the speech given by Hillary Clinton when she gave a speech entitled women's rights are human rights and she says if there is one message that echoes from this conference it is that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights let us not forget that among those nights are the right to women to be heard the right to be heard women must enjoy the right to participate fully in the social and political lives of the countries as if we want freedom and democracy to thrive and endure. I mean speeches have always helped create a sort of awareness fine and that also through public speaking. We have uh, from time to time seen it even depicted in literature. So, this public speaking has been a mode of communication. There are several initiatives my dear friend and in literature you can find plethora of examples even if you go to the uh, genesis of uh, uh, dramas I mean especially English dramas we have found that it also used to be a rich mode of performance in public speaking because public speaking is a sort of performance speaking. It is actually a sort of medium through which the speakers put stories into action, they convert their stories into action. In Europe and Greece, dramas had a religious origin and you know the dramas, if we come to the beginning of it, when it began, no, the vernacular plays in the European Middle Ages were named as miracle, mystery and morality plays. In miral, uh, miracle plays, uh, there was depiction of uh, the martyrdom of saint it could be real or fictional, but then it was all through oral, you know, it was all through oral recitations and all. By 13th century, it comprised unecclesiastical elements as well. On the right hand side, you can keep picture, uh, you can see, have a look at pictures and you can relate to it. Now, when we talk of mystery plays, these mystery plays, uh, they also represented biblical subjects. I mean, the need was. Uh, to talk about or to make people aware about man's creation, fall and redemption. It uh, since it did not have proper structure it started in the churches later when the number of actors increased it started being, uh, being uh, enacted in churchyards and then they did not used to have the present day style of theatres and all. Uh, so, the dramas were mounted I mean on a wagon and the wagon having wheels and then with a curtain the scaffolding and the lower part of the wagon used to be the green room or the dressing room. My dear friends, later on you know in the 16th century Europe morality plays uh, came into being and then the major focus was to let people understand the difference between good and evil. One of uh, the best of all times uh, morality play is every man where you know every man is summoned by death and the implication is that nothing in life can help you escape death. It was somewhere between uh, the transition from the liturgical drama and secular professional drama and in those days uh, we did not have uh, the characters as human beings. They were abstract characters and these uh, abstract characters were life, death, repentance, goodness, love, greed, other virtues and vices. So, in a way what I intend to say is that through 
public speaking, there has been an aim to create a sort of awareness and people have also been filled with a desire to speak, to enunciate, to enjoy and to appreciate the beauties of life through speech. Nowadays, in modern day times, there are so many initiatives. Uh, people get times to speak on different topics, on a myriad of topics like International Over Days, Awareness Day, on autism, no health, pollution. I mean, quite a good number of things and topics are available. And all these actually help. These are different forms. All these actually help the speakers to bring into their talk or in their speeches several nuances that can help them become a better person. So public speaking has its uh, wings in religion and we find that even our uh, major prophets and major saints, uh, namely Jesus, Guru Nanak or Buddha, all of them delivered sermons. And through these sermons, everyone came to be aware and which were later documented also. Even you know, many of you might be aware of the fact that Buddha's sayings uh, came to be uh, written in the form of uh, Dhamma, Dhamma Pada, fine. Uh, and uh, uh, w in the later part uh, when you know Ambedkar wrote a very beautiful novel based on Buddha's teachings. So we have uh, plenty of examples. Public speaking was in practice since ancient days and the major aim of these uh, speeches were uh, to bring a sort of awareness among the mankind and to distinguish between good and evil. We can take here the Buddha's first sermon where he says, the novel truth of suffering uh, is this. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering. Association with the unpleasant is suffering, dissociation from the pleasant is suffering, not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. Now, you can find uh, how beautifully the words have been choses, chosen and then the small sentences, I mean three word sentences, but in those three words, the words of wisdom have already been told. My dear friends, public speaking has been in practice since long. Of course, we have come a long way and all of us, if we want to be public speakers, because we understand from this lecture that nothing in the world is as important as having a good tongue, as having a good speech. Here we can take one excer excerpt from Gita where it says, Indriyani mano buddhir buddhirasya dhisthana muchyate etair bimo hatyese etair bimo bimo yatyese jnana bam vritya dehinam. I mean this is from uh, this is lines, uh, these are lines which uh, uh, Arjuna uh, tell, which Arjuna is told by Krishna and the meaning is our senses, mind and intellect, they act as the breeding ground for desire. They cloud one's knowledge and delude the embodied soul. So, as a public speaker also, we have to see the importance of speech and for that our sense mind and intellect should co-mingle. If we do that, perhaps we will be in a better position to speak on various occasions and we will uh, we'll be able to understand the various forms and stages of public speaking which we are going to discuss in the lectures to come. But before we come to wind up this talk, uh, let me uh, take a quote by Quintilian who was uh, one of the earlier orators who says, God that all powerful creator of nature and architect of the world has impressed man with no character so proper to distinguish him from other animals as by the faculty of speech. So speech has come to stay and it will stay always when there is a proper cooperation between the audience and the speaker and the speaker and as a speaker, all of us have to realize this fact. With this, let me come to the end of this talk. Thank you very much for your patience.